The next step is that the virus has to be taken up into the cell, and viruses use cellular pathways to do that. They don't invent anything. They use endocytic pathways, and now we, we think they're using some other uh, uptake pathways as well. So in general, cells do take a lot of things into them. They phagocytose, as you know, big particles, and they endocytose smaller particles. And there's a process called pinocytosis, or cellular drinking, where the, the membrane, the plasma membrane of a cell is always invaginating and, and breaking off vesicles and taking in the extracellular contents. And it just recently, it's been found that some viruses actually get into cells this way. Uh, what we mainly know about virus entry is that they utilize the receptor-mediated endocytic pathway. Uh, this is a pathway by which ligands are taken into the cell. The ligands bind receptors on the cell surface. Uh, the cell surface invaginates, becomes vesicles, and then move into the cell via the endocytic pathway. So viruses do this. You can imagine this is a virus particle binding its receptor. It then gets taken up into the cell uh, by endocytosis. So we're going to look at a couple of examples of this in some detail. Now moving within the cell. Um, when I was young, the textbooks that I looked at in biology, the cytoplasm was empty. Maybe there was a mitochondrion or a ribosome here and there. But that's obviously not the way it is. This is more like what the cytoplasm looks like. Here's the plasma membrane, and then you have some uh, cytoskeletal elements right below it and moving into the cell. You see it's completely packed. There's some ribosomes in here. And moving further down into the cell, here's the ER, uh, and here's a clathrin-coated vesicle. And then moving further in, here's the nucleus. Here's a nuclear pore and things moving through it. And then, of course, our nucleosome DNA in the nucleus. So it's really jam-packed. <coughs> but viruses have to move through this. They don't diffuse. There's just no way they would diffuse. It would take forever. So here's a, here's a uh, thought experiment which was done to make this point. These are estimated rates of transport of viruses either in water or the cytoplasm. So we take uh, the polio capsid, for example, the time to travel 10 microns in water, 3.85 seconds. In the cytoplasm, if you apply a viscosity factor of some sort, it would take a half an hour to move 10 microns, which isn't a lot. Herpes virus would take 14 in some seconds to move 10 microns in water, two hours to move in the cytoplasm, and vaccinia would take five hours to move just by diffusion. So the point here is that viruses don't diffuse. They're actively transported uh, along cellular pathways. And this next slide is a summary of some of these transport pathways uh, that we'll talk about. And you can see here viruses here, they can enter at the plasma membrane. Trans this is a particular virus that has to get to the nucleus. You can see it's, it's moving down a microtubule carried by a motor, in this case dynein, the motor that brings things towards the centrosome. All right, so eventually that capsid will make it to the nucleus where it wants to go. Uh, some viruses are taken in by endocytosis. It can be clathrin dependent. It can be clathrin independent. It can be caviolin dependent. <coughs> doesn't matter. In all cases, the movement of the endocytic vesicles occurs along microtubules. It's driven by motors that move the vesicles along with the virus in it until the virus gets out, and we'll see how that happens a bit later on. All right, so the, the point here is that things don't just diffuse in the cytoplasm. They have to move using energy, and that's what viruses do. So here we have our first movie, which is an animation of a vesicle moving along a microtubule with dynein motors. And this is, of course, a little unrealistic because it's not crowded enough in here. There's not enough stuff around. But uh, this would be a vesicle. A virus could be in there, an endocytic vesicle. There's your dynein motor uh, walking along the microtubule. It just looks so human, right, the way it's walking. So that gives you an idea of how this is happening. And of course, every step of the motor requires hydrolysis of, uh, of an energy molecule. So this could be a virus in there. So this is a great company that does scientific animation, Ex, Ex Vivo. I think we'll be looking at a couple of those. Now some viruses, as you might have seen on that previous uh, summary slide, actually fuse at the plasma membrane and 
you know, depending on what the virus is, that may be all that they have to do. So here we have a paramyxovirus, which is an envelope virus, negative strand RNA. It's fusing at the plasma membrane. So it's binding a receptor, and then fusion occurs, and then the helical capsid, the RNA protein complex, is in the cytoplasm, and that's all it needs to go. It doesn't need to go anywhere else. It doesn't have to get to the nucleus and it can start making messenger RNAs right there. So let's talk a little bit about how these fusion reactions occur. So again, this is a paramyxovirus that fuses at the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane, of course, is neutral pH. And I'm telling you that because in a, in a few moments we'll contrast this with an acid-dependent fusion mechanism. So here the virus is binding a receptor. There's a viral glycoprotein interacting with whatever the receptor is. Uh, and we're now looking that up in an in a expanded view here in part B. So here's the viral membrane. And there's a protein, a glycoprotein called the HN protein that stands for hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. That will bind a receptor. Okay, so here you see the <coughs> virus is attaching to the cell receptor, which is the red molecule here on the plasma membrane. And then the next thing that's going to happen is there's a conformational change in this neighboring protein, this green protein, which is called the F or the fusion protein. This is the protein that's actually going to fuse the two membranes. Uh, what happens here is when the receptor of the virus engages with the receptor in the cell, uh, that transmits a conformational change to the fusion peptide, which can then unfold, it fits into the cell membrane and the two, the two membranes are brought close together and then they can fuse. They can undergo fusion so that the virus membrane and the cell membrane become one and the viral RNA can get out. So it's, it's a brilliant scheme. Now you see here in these initial stages the fusion protein is folded back and that's because you don't want this fusion peptide exposed. This is a short amino acid sequence of highly hydrophobic amino acids. If it gets close to any membrane, it's going to fuse with it. So you, these viruses don't want to be bumping around into various membranes and fusing at will. If they bump into the wrong cell, they're going to lose their nucleic acid because it can't replicate. So the fusion peptide is kept hidden against the virus membrane until the virus finds the right receptor. Then that signals a trigger, fusion protein expands, fusion can happen. So this is an example of a spring-loaded interaction that we talked about, I think, last time. These viruses are spring-loaded to uncoat, but only in the right cell. And here the signal is simply interacting with the right receptor. So that's one example which happens with measles viruses. On the bottom is what happens with HIV. And this is a more complicated situation, but basically the virus, again, has a glycoprotein with a part here it's labeled SU. Uh, this is the part that will attach uh, to the receptor. And here's the fusion peptide. It's hidden against the membrane again, just like in the paramyxoviruses. With HIV, there need to be two receptors engaged in order to get fusion. And it also occurs at the cell surface, by the way. First, this yellow SU portion binds CD4. CD4 is a molecule present on CD4 positive T cells. This is why the virus uh, preferentially infects those cells. Uh, it binds CD4. The binding then exposes a portion of this SU protein so that it can bind the co-receptor. So you see this little loop here is now bumping out. This is sort of a shorthand for conformational change. Now SU can also bind the, co the chemokine receptor, which is one of the other receptors for HIV CCR. And then finally, when both molecules are engaged, then the signal goes to the fusion peptide here. It's called TM. It flips out, inserts into the cell membrane, and then the two membranes fuse. So in general, fusion happens when you bring two membranes very close together. You have to bring them right next to each other, get rid of all the water molecules in between, and then they will fuse. It's not easy to do, it's hard, and that's why you have to use a protein like this fusion protein to engage and then pull them together. All right, so that's two different ways of fusing at the surface, either using um, just a single receptor or one receptor, or two receptors engaging the, the same viral glycoprotein. All right, so here's another movie. This is of HIV entry into the cell. This is a, a different animation company, but this is also pretty well done. Here you can see the glycoproteins are evenly distributed. 
the artist's license. They decided it looked better this way. So the virus is here in the blood, red blood cells. These are CD4 positive lymphocytes. And virus is going to run into one of those. And on the surface of the CD4 lymphocyte are the two receptor molecules, CD4 and the chemokine receptor, CCR. And looming in the background is our virion, which is going to approach. And these are the glycoproteins on the virion surface. They're going to, these are going to be interacting. And this is actually the fusion peptide. You can see it's buried up there against the virus membrane. So it doesn't spontaneously fuse with anything. So first the virus engages CD4. And then there's a conformational change and then the, re the uh, glycoprotein can then engage the chemokine receptor. And once those two things happen, well, the artist decided to get rid of everything. <laughs> but they remain, and the fusion peptide expands, inserts into the plasma membrane. This is accompanied by what's called a hair pinning. The, the peptide begins to bend. And that draws the two molecules, uh, the, the virus and the, and the cell, very close together, which is what you need in order to get fusion. And the viral membrane fuses with that of the cell, and here's the nucleocapsid uh, entering the cell. And this, of course, has the nucleic acid in it and the enzymes that are needed to, uh, to copy it. 